So we're going to get started here um, at the event today. Um, thank you so much for everyone joining us. This is, uh, you know, we've been really enjoying these events with the Emily H. Tremaine uh, uh, Curatorial of Journalism Fellowships for Curators. Let me just get that right. Um, and of course, with those of you who joined us last week, we had the pleasure of listening to Tani Atone, um, who's a wonderful curator, spoke about her experience working with the Kiowa tribe in Oklahoma, as well as the other, um, you know, the other challenges she faces as a Native American curator telling the stories of their community. Um, and this week we have another very special guest. And actually I've been very eager to lock, talk to Latanya for a very long time because uh, I followed her on Twitter. She has a very active Twitter presence among other presences. Um, and uh, I just wanna introduce her first. And first of all, I wanna say, um, I'm speaking from Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which is historically uh, the land of the Lenape people, um, the unceded territory of the Lenape people, as well as, as Tani uh, reminded us last week, um, uh, the Haudenosaunee, as well as the Shinnecock out in Long Island. Um, so I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that. And now I want to introduce a little bit of Latanya Autry, who's been doing some wonderful posts for us, as well as an email exhibition that many of you may have seen that um, was sent out to the hyperallergic um, email subscribers uh, on Sunday. Um, Latanya Autry is a recipient of Art Tables 2021 New Leadership Award, exercises her laboratory curatorial praxis through developing exhibitions and programming in institutional spaces such as Yale University Art Gallery, MOCA Cleveland, ArtSpace New Haven, as well as in various non-institutional collaborative freedom projects, including the Black Liberation Center and the Social Justice and Museums Resource Center, the Art of Black Descent, and probably most famously for many of you, Museums Are Not Neutral, which is a hashtag you should definitely follow um, if you don't know about it. She's completing her PhD at art history, in art history at the University of Delaware, Delaware, and her dissertation is The Crossroads of Commemoration, Lynching Landscapes in America, which examines the interplay of race, representation, memory, and public space. Thank you for joining us, Latanya. Oh, thank you. This is really wonderful to be in conversation. I really appreciate it. And we've already received a note from one of the people here saying it was a fantastic exhibit and essay. So um, I think people have been following your work and I'm excited to, to know that they've been uh, seeing what you're, what you're doing. So um, we talked about preliminary, there's a lot of different um, avenues this can go. So I wanted to start with a question at the beginning, which is, you know, you're best known of museums are not, not neutral, or at least uh, I think maybe for some people outside of your curatorial work, so I would love to start with a, a question connected to that, which is, ha, did you ever think curating was neutral? And what have you learned as a curator about that topic? Yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for that question. Um, I've never thought anything was probably neutral <laughs> and especially about um, museums or institutions. I mean, I have grown and my thinking has been evolving, of course, over the years. So when we kicked off this campaign, um, I started this with Mike Morawski, who's an educator, and he lives out in Portland, Oregon, and um, a museum educator. And you know, we were both kind of fed up with this mythology that's in museums a lot of times, um, in, in many, not just art museums, but a lot of museums say that they're, they're neutral spaces. And we were like, they're just not, you know, these are shaped, they're, they're right. the fact of what a, a museum is in the first place, that construct really comes out of um, the Enlightenment period, the modern museum that we know today. And it is, you know, shaped by um, colonialism, imperialism and capitalism and all of these things. And, you know, it, and outside of like, you know, having that kind of meta focus, if you just look at the his the the recent histories of museums and the practices of today, they're always shaped, they're shaped by people. People are, you know, making choices. None of these choices are neutral. So yeah, I never thought it was neutral. My thoughts have been evolving though, like over um, the course of this, when we started in 2017 and now it's been like, whatever, well, five years in August, it'd be um, about the possibilities, especially of hegemonic institutions to change, to transform. Mm -hmm. Can they do it? Can they not do it? 
Um, that, that stuff has been changing my mind, ideas about equity, those kind of things have been developing. But yeah, I, I never thought that curating was really a neutral thing, no. Yeah. Well, you know, part of this question, as I mentioned uh, once before to you, it's like in the UK, a survey come out, came out and it seemed like people trusted curators um, probably more than almost other any other profession in the UK. And I think that brought up the question of, of what the public perception of curating is. So I wonder in your own work, what are some of the perceptions you've encountered and how do you challenge them or how do you perhaps um, augment them or or just understand them for yourself. Yeah, that's that survey. I didn't read that report, but I saw people talking about it on social media and really kind of um, laughing almost that or <laughs> that people that trust curators. You know, I I don't have a lot of experience with museums in the UK, so you know, I'm not going <laughs> to them. But I do know, you know, the general histories, and I actually talk to people who live in uh, England and Scotland, and you know, like I follow these things too, right? And and I've talked um, with museum studies classes in Scotland. Um, yeah, this, this trustworthy thing, it's a real interesting thing, like what trust means, what neutrality means, all of this stuff, you really got to kind of take it apart and thinking about it. And here in the US, they do a survey too, where people talk about that They just think the museums are extremely trustworthy kind of spaces. And I'm like, mm, I don't know, you should you probably think about that a little bit more if you do. Um, you know, a lot of times when these surveys come out, they don't talk about who is, who, who, the, who the people are that they're polling. You don't even know who they are. Is it just people who already go to the institution? It's often a very select, like here in the US, people go to art museums, especially that's a very thin um, sliver of the American population that are regularly going to art museums. So those patrons are very different than the typical demographic and stuff. Um, yeah. so ideas people have about curating it it really you know it, it, sometimes it runs by the type of institution that it is mm -hmm. and um you know if it's an art museum versus a history museum there are a lot of there's some people who think history museums are more trustworthy than like an art museum and they wouldn't right. expect art museums to be trustworthy they, they think that's just about you know you go there and you have a some kind of experience of sensing things and you know things are about beauty like i'm just going to say these i don't I don't talk like this, but this is often kind of a um, conception that this is about beauty. And there are people who say you're supposed to have um, some kind of elevated experience in the art museum space. It's going to transport you or something like that. Um, it may, I guess. I mean, personally, that's not happened to me too much in art museums. I spent a lot of time in them. But right. um, yeah, that's you know some of the ideas that people have about it. And I, you know, I, it's people are making decisions. They get trained. There, it's was interesting to me as an art historian. So my background is in art history, and I do get really interested in them, like theories and ideas. And I took that that kind of thinking with me into the museum space. And it was funny. One of the first times I was working in an art museum, or a, a museum in general, it wasn't an art museum. But the person said, "Oh, this is why I got into museums is to avoid all that stuff because they didn't want it." Wow. You know, yeah, and so people sometimes who are in the museum space will think a lot that their work is very much only about objects, and it's just about the object, and I focus, it's all in the object, I get all the truth, everything I need to know is in this thing right here, everything else, there, you know, and it's not everybody, but this is quite sure. a few people, and I was, you know, surprised by that somewhat, and I was like, I mean, I come out of a, you know, a focus of paying attention to a lot of social history, Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, I do, of course, pay attention to the formal properties of art and things, but I do think about social history and I think about theories and stuff like that. And I think think of these things as existing in the world and context matters and all of that. So it is partly sometimes very different opinions with people who really don't have much experience at all with museums or don't work in them. And it's, you know, maybe a place that they go sometimes they want to bring their kids to. But it's even sometimes I'm at odds with people who work in the institution too, who have a very um, singular kind of idea about what cur curatorial work is. And a lot of people don't think it involves um, engaging with public so much. And I, for me, it, it does. I like to, when I do an exhibition and when it's on view, I like to spend a lot of time in the gallery. I like to talk to people. I like to give those tours. I really love doing that part. That's not a lot of people's practice. And I like creating programs and stuff. Again, that's 
for some curators, it's not something that they're really that excited about. No, and I think it, and sometimes it's, it's such a, a good way of putting it. I think sometimes also they shy away from it because it sort of suggests that, you know, well, I won't have my expert opinion. And it sort of sometimes is sort of uh, needs to be listened to. And I think one uh, idea that you you've really sort of, uh, you know, interrogated a little bit, and I think in your own work is also the question, the idea of what raising awareness and representation mean. So do you want to talk a little bit about it as a curator? Because I think we hear this whole idea of raising awareness as if like that's sort of a goal in and of itself, um, you know, that it's important. And I just want to mention for those of you who have questions, please, there's a Q&A section on the, on the um, Zoom. Please feel free to add your question there. Or if you'd like to put it in the chat, I can uh, make sure to circle back. So um, yeah, so that question about raising awareness, LaTanya. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, that's a, you know, it's interesting because I don't know when this started. I, you know, I'd like to see an article on this. Somebody probably wrote it and I just haven't read it. But when this idea of social justice um, start being applied to art and culture institutions, um, a lot of people I've met in museums tend to think that social justice in museums mean that they do an exhibition about a particular theme and their goal is they're going to raise awareness about this topic. So it could be climate change, it could be, um, you know, police brutality, it could be, it could be anything, right? You know, all of these different things that we, um, it's now a pandemic, you know, all these different things that we experience as, as people. And they think that that exhibition in itself, which could be great, you know, and they could bring in really great artists or have really wonderful um, exhibits and artifacts and all that. But they think that because they did that, now they've done social justice. And I'm like, no, you know, like uh, that, that can be great. It also could be really bad <laughs> or it could be just mediocre, but it, it doesn't actually change any of the conditions. Um, so the, yeah, this is a thing. And, you know, representation, you hear this hashtag, representation matters. And like, it does. But we do need to kind of push and ask questions about how so, <laughs> like to who, um, where, how, what, you know, we need to ask all of those kind of questions and apply that to it. Otherwise, we can be falling for tricks that people do where they can bring in a particular thing and go, well, we've done that. We've, we've covered it and we're done. Where in reality, a lot of museums have a lot of, you know, these same problems that we see in society are very much a part of the museum and sometimes at a very extreme levels to me more so in museums than in some other spaces. I was, um, I've worked in a lot of other sectors too, but working in museums, I was like, whoa, this is intense over here. Um, if we were doing social justice, we would be trying to actually just start working on our own mess first, like <laughs> yeah. institution. Yeah. And that's they go, oh no, that this has nothing to to do with us you know and that's where they kind of pull that we're neutral we're outside of that it's it's just over here that these problems are hurt occur racism only happens outside or something and you might even get them to say that racism happens here but we've got to work on you know we just got to get back to work we don't have time for that um yeah it's a i think that's a I, th I think that's such a great point because i think there this I think there's still a perception of museums being this magical place that's sort of removed from the outside world. And I think that's where it's it's really interesting because even with our work with hyperallergic, it's been really um, interesting that it's like, it's when you criticize things outside the art world, everyone's sort of applauding. But once you start criticizing things within the art world and the art community, people are kind of like, they're, they're, backs arch a little they kind of get uncomfortable because it feels like somehow it's like then that clear boundary doesn't exist anymore and i think that's sort of interesting that definitely happens exactly like in the way of museums where you were saying where this idea it's oh it's outside the outside the walls not inside the walls mm -hmm. so i think that's such a great point um so I wanted to ask, somebody actually had a question I, I thought was sort of relevant to this, um, or at least, you know, somewhat connected. And I'd love to ask you that, which is, you know, I think in your, in your exhibition, as well as in your piece, you, you do a really great job in always making citations to other people's work, because you see this, it seems, at least from the outside, as a cumulative process, right? You're building on other people's work and contributing to it. So how do you integrate readings into your curation. Someone specifically asked about Black liberation readings, but I think that's true in general of all the readings. Like, how do you integrate them? And how do you, do you feel in dialogue with these texts? Or how do you sort of work with them? 
Um, I hope so. You know, I read a lot of books. It can be actually pretty overwhelming. It's funny that you have that book background. Um, Cause I'm just like, what's on your shelf? <laughs> It could be rather I'd be happy to lend you a book after this is over. I might, I might, I might take you up on that. Um, yeah, but I do try to, you know, think with other people. And I, I see these books as gifts that people have spent. It's a lot of labor to write anything for real essay and then to write a book. I, you know, it's a lot. Um, I have been trying to do that. And I think the, the first show I really did that in is um, Temporary Spaces of Joy and Freedom. That show was, and the name comes from a, a discussion that was between Leanne Batas Masaki Simpson and um, Dion Brand. And um, Leanne in there, um, um, she is talking about her book, As We Have Always Done, which I think I have over here, As We Have Always Done Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Resistance. I learned so much reading this book, and I felt like you know, I was, I've been in processes of transformation, of course, ongoing, but this also kind of pushed me to really try to go there and create a different way to um, curate. And I like how she talks about like thinking with people, thinking with other scholars and stuff. That was something that excited me about their discussion of her and brand. But a lot of, um, you know, people that I read, they're doing this thing because I think sometimes I've been looking for these discussions in physical places like when I was a student especially like in coursework in graduate school I was hoping that graduate school is going to be this extremely intellectual space where we're going to be constantly doing this and people were like you know we did that in the seminar room we're not doing that over here you're kind of crazy you want to do that all the time I did <laughs> so um that that world didn't I didn't find that world you know they had they show that in movies but I, I never encountered that but um, so I just bought a whole bunch of books and I try to do that with the books and I hope I'm, you know, figuring it out. It's hard though, because you don't, you don't get to ask people questions. You're just doing it and trying to figure it out. The great part about doing that with um, an exhibition is, you know, if I feel like I've tried to understand this, then I could try to, like, I reached out to um, Leanne Batas Masaki Simpson and said, you know, I like this discussion and I've read your book and I want to create this exhibition, you know, and then it becomes a thing and we, and, and you can bring in, and I thought of other artists that didn't necessarily um, know Leanne's actual scholarship, but their work to me felt like it was in sync with, and, um, and it was a very small show, but I thought it was like it opened a lot of doors and it was really exciting and a good way to could think. And the show is kind of, that particular show was in 2020 and it was thinking about um, co-resistance, indigenous and black um, um, people working together to kind of like fight white supremacy and settler colonialism. And it was very different than anything I've ever done. And it just kind of opened some new doors to me, but yeah, books are, my mom always said, books are our friends. And, um, I'm a geek enough to actually really believe that books are our friends and um, they cannot be at certain sometimes, but in general, I do try to think with these books and have an opportunity. So some idea that I get in it, I think I can kind of come back to it again and work with other people who are also working along these lines and we can create an exhibition that's really on that same certain kind of concept. We can create something again and it'd be different, but it, you know, it'd be along those lines. Makes sense. Um, now the question of social justice, you know, I think there is like a mythology in the art world that believes that everything in the art world is progressive or, you know, I think, in the, and it's sort of like, you know, I, I actually think it's pretty cross the board at this perception or at least the majority um, of people um, have this perception. Now, where does that come from? And where, why do you think that exists? And what, I mean, what is it doing? How does it function in, in the arts community? Yeah, that's that's a real big one. I was real surprised by that once I was, I don't know if I was even working there or something. I was just in this gallery on campus as a grad student and a professor told me something like she liked the exhibit, which I was like, that's great. And she said something like, well, it's art. So, you know, of course it's about freedom and, and, and democracy and all this stuff. And I was like, what? Well, not necessarily, I mean, this artist is about that, um, but not all of it is. And I thought that was interesting, especially because she is a professor, um, not of art history, but like a, in another discipline. And I thought that's, that's interesting. And then I start talking to more people and you can see that a lot of people in the arts too really believe that 
the the things because it's in the arts it's naturally progressive it's all of the stuff and i'm like it there's plenty of reactionary people in the arts i mean art in this society is a commodity like it's right. you know i mean come on it's part of commerce and stuff and um i think you know as an art historian a lot of my training was like not looking at issues of the market and stuff. It was almost kind of like shunned to, to talk about that. And I felt very uncomfortable and still do in some ways. But um, yeah, working in contemporary art more, I really start understanding how the, how, what these systems are. This is, you know, a capitalist um, society and art is part of all of that. And this whole thing about art being somewhat it's this rhetoric I mean it happens in photography too people have this idea that photography by nature from very early on from its inception and still that photography is naturally democratic and something. objective yeah and objective, objective, right? Right? You know, all of this kind of stuff and I think that's really kind of comes out of this certain kind of liberal politics and liberal humanism kind of thoughts mm -hmm. um, I mean it's something I'm really interested in I used to be a philosophy student a long time ago and left that but I think I'm still kind of that person because I'm still interested in a lot of the concept stuff and trying to figure out like where things started and how those concepts have like um, seeped into society in a variety of ways. But yeah, liberal humanism, I think, is this idea and like our idea like the, of humanity, these kind of all of these kind of constructs. I think they kind of come about at the same time with the Enlightenment period. Right. And if you think about like just general art history, you know, art as um, it's interesting because they'll, they'll be having this kind of rhetoric of art as being what like art for art's sake it's individualistic but yet at the same time it's all about democracy and freedom a lot of this stuff doesn't even align they don't they don't go together in an easy continuity but the myths are all existing at the same time um, that's what's really interesting about it but yeah anyway I just try to tell people to be really cautious about these claims of um that everything is about freedom i'm like come on fascists make art <laughs> let's just be anybody real. that's right art and doesn't really it, have a specific role that way right yeah it, it's things get co-opted too sometimes what from what people you know the producer might have intended but then when it, it sometimes it's when an institution gets its hands on it and how and then it gets in history and how people write about it. all of this is, is so many layers of meaning that yeah there's no way that you to me that you could say that if you're actually using critical thinking skills so totally and of course museums uh, they're often you know they're educational institutes right mm -hmm. or at least a lot of their nonprofit sort of status relies on this idea of them educating people and i'm wondering as a curator do you see yourself as an educator like is is that kind of a bit of the role you play or do you do you think that's different from the traditional idea of what a curator is like how do, how do you see that sinking up for you yeah people have different you know different curators have thoughts about this and some people really um do not want to be part of or don't think of their work as being an educator some of us do i do i actually love teaching um outside of museums anyway i, I didn't think i was going to but then when i had the um opportunity to teach as a graduate student teaching classes i really loved it um and that's part probably why i like to talk to people about the art and be in the part of why i like to be in the space i do like to actually see the art in in the space too and see the relationships that form when it's on view um but yeah i see my work i see myself as an educator and and see that i have responsibilities in, in a way as an educator but not everybody does there's certain kind of more conventional ideas of curators or like a more old fashioned idea, or I could say, but it'd be some people still do it more about as an expertise um, kind of thing, a connoisseurship kind of focus. And I mean, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. That's a particular perspective. It's not one that I have, but this idea I wanted to go back to about the museum as being an educational space. Um, yeah, maybe, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're, we're going to be honest. Yeah, maybe so, maybe not. And I saw somebody wrote in the com in the comment about the art world being a, a epicenter of money laundering and appropriation and theft. Yes, <laughs> all of that. And um, you know, museums participated in that. And different institutions have thoughts about like how much education is going to be a part of um, you know what they their of their work or part of their mission, and then how they do it. Of course, is is a thing in itself. 
sometimes I think the, the education can feel like indoctrinization at some places or with certain people, um, not across the board, but sometimes. Um, but yeah, anyway, I, I do think of my work as being an educator. And that's why I also think of it as something that can happen in lots of different kinds of places. It's not, I'm not really beholden to actually a framework of like, this is the, a, a museum. One of the things I found interesting is, especially with these layoffs that started in 2020 with the pandemic, um, a lot of museum workers, especially people with frontline workers um, and educators and stuff, you know, people really on, who were on the floor seeing people they got laid off, got furloughed and laid off, and, and other people too, but especially them, they got hit really hard in the beginning. And a lot of people I was um, following, you know, this whole thing that was happening, and some people really shook them, not just because of the, you know, horrible thing about trying to figure out how you're going to pay for stuff and insurance and all that, but really their identity, their professional identity got shook because they're museum educators, but they really saw them themselves as museum. And it is a, it's different than teaching in a classroom. But to me, I'm kind of like, you're an educator. Like you, you have this, it is a particular skill set to do it with objects or experiences like in a, in a museum space, but also um, you're an educator to me. It's not that it's limited to that frame, at least in my thinking, and it's not everybody else's, but, um, it was something that I felt like there was this massive kind of mourning that was happening with museum workers because they had really lost something and they didn't know what, what they would do now without an, a museum. Well, it's also to bring a, to, to emphasize that point, it's, you know, it was amazing how the museum values of various institutions uh, appeared during the pandemic. Where like somewhere like the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco actually, didn't hire, fire any of their educators and actually kind of said, okay, now your mission is more important in a way, do you know? And they said, okay, we're gonna transition and we're sort of like do that while other institutions thought, okay, we don't need educators. And it sort of really questioned that. So what do you think the relationship of educator, museum educators to curators are? Because in some institutions I've seen very strict lines, like this idea of it's super, and I'm not quite sure why, because it feels like their missions are, are connected, but, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely experienced that. <laughs> There's often a tension in, um, you know, these, especially like larger places that can really have um, teams of people. Because some places are so small that, you know, you're just doing everything. Um, right. That can be, feel kind of like too much over, um, right. too much work. But sometimes that's the best experience at these smaller places. Um, because you go to a bigger place and you think, oh, this is great. I don't have to try to do everything. I don't have to have all these hats. But there can be these divisions that are really strong and cultures that are set up, you know, they've been there for decades or whatever, however long the place has been around for 50 years, 80 years, 100 years, whatever. And it can be really hard to break through that. There's, um, and some of it I get with educators, sometimes they're very defensive about like, you know, holding their line because they don't want curators trying to tell them um, how to talk about art and they don't think the curators necessarily do a great job and they can be definitely right about that at times. Um, and then curators may really find that educators are not um, talking about the work in the right kind of way. It, it, it's often like a, lo a lot of tension actually sometimes between these two departments. And um, I knew about that before I started, you know, I did these museum studies classes and I, when I, when I started these classes, I wasn't, I mean, I was partly studying, taking a class to understand like what a museum job would be like vocational training. But for me, it was more actually to, to study the museum as a cultural product and to, I've always been really more probably interested in that than thinking of this as job training or something. So to me, it was like, okay, so here are these cultures that exist and I had heard of them and I had worked in some places before. But then when I got in there, I found that often those are like, whoa, this is intense. You know, people are holding firm on their line and someone told me, well, you're not an educator. And I was like, I've taught, you know, several classes. And I, yeah, I've taken, I've done these um, certificates in teaching and higher education teaching and not museum teaching. I'm not saying I'm that, but I do see my work as, as an educator. And um, yeah, so anyway, people have these, they draw their, they draw their lines. I think some of it is job security, but it's also very different kind of you know, focus a lot of times what what people are, what they privilege and the and how they talk 
And um, some of it is, you know, right. Sometimes the educators have is that curators privilege certain kind of things and use certain sometimes certain kind of language. Um, but at the same time, sometimes we might be making assumptions about what how much information people can handle. And maybe there are different styles. Like one thing I learned, I went to a, um, a training once or a conference and, and I actually went to this, I kind of snuck in. I didn't know, I, I just sat in and later found out you're supposed to pay to go to this workshop, but it was great. And it was with Sites of Conscious and which is this nonprofit group that is like a group of historic sites around the world um, that, you know, like really amazing historic and traumatic, often traumatic things happen. Um, so Robbins Island in South Africa is, is part of the Sites of Conscious and the Tenement Museum in New York. So uh, all kinds, so it's a range of kind of places. Anyway, they gave this training and it was on facilitation methods. And I really got a lot out of it. And I came back and then started trying to use it in things that I do. And um, I found that some museum education people, I found that it's a thing where some people really don't like that method because it's not an interpret interpretive method it's this facilitation method which they did say it was you know and to me i was like that's fine and also i'm often really open to trying things out and i want to see will this work and i'll in in these in this set of conditions if i do this what happens if i do i have that kind of uh like i just want to try things out almost like a, a almost like an experiment a laboratory where i want to try things and I found that sometimes it really doesn't work well within the museum. They like this established thing that they've already set and they're like, we, and sometimes they do some stuff really well, but they keep doing it, doing it the same way and they plug in different themes or something, but it's the same project really over and over. And I'm like, well, can we do it different? And if we brought in more people, um, you know, often it's just places also that have really limited who can work there. So they already set up a paradigm and then they tell you, this is the way, this is our best, or what do they call it? Best practices, right? And this is the way it works. And I'm like, okay, I learned that, but I want to try something else. And they're like, no, <laughs> you know, like we don't want something else. So um, that can be kind of a struggle sometimes with people. And they could be like, but that's not, their value set isn't for this facilitation model that's really about trying to understand what people already know and what they're about versus I really want to talk to you about this, you know, thing I have right here where the discussion right. is about this versus the discussion is about this um, yeah. about society. So it's it's about mind frame, but it's also a lot of stuff about sedimentic cultures that happen with these things that are called institutions. Absolutely. So now let's talk about your curatorial project, Beholding Black World Making. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that came about? as well as a, a little bit about the exhibition, the email exhibition you put together for the hyperallergic subscribers um, and what that, you know, and, and how you thought about that and how that's connected to the larger project. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of like a, you know, I'm, I'm still like kind of shaping this, but it's really a response to a question that I got in 2020 when I was organizing this teaching that I did called The Art of Collective Care and Responsibility, Handling Images of Black Suffering and Death. So in planning that, the question someone asked me, well, you know, in doing this, okay, this sounds fine. You're gonna do this, this workshop thing, but how will this change anything? You know, and it was, it's a really important question. And I have to say, I, I was like, okay, let's just get real. Let's get real. Um, it's not gonna change the field is not gonna change anything immediately or necessarily in 10 years. I mean, it, I think what it, and I told the person is I think what it does is that for those of us who care about this, who are looking for resources and looking for ways to operate, it can be really useful for us. So in that way, it does do something, but will it, will it people who don't care about this at all is give, and you know, it's the whole thing. Like if you do a program, does it change everything? It doesn't. But I thought, is this is an issue that for me is very important and really relates to stuff that I've dedicated years and years of study to. And um, I wanna think through this. I'm really interested in concepts of ethics and visual ethics. Like what does it mean working with images that are you know, about this? And um, this stuff is complicated. And I decided, well, I wanted to spend more time on it. And I think my answer was that 
this is one thing and it really needs to be a whole set of practices and really some changes in relations like how we operate and and so i saw that as just like one crumb and then what would happen later so this is for me beholding black role making as part of like a shift for me in thinking about my own what i think of curatorial work of what it is and can be and where this work of actually like for me i'm very interested in connecting with um, communities and really being in conversation with people and i have a real like i've had a long time a long time interest in social justice work and thinking about where that work can really happen and can't happen and also into critique social justice because that's that's a conversation too but it, you know it's another talk um not <laughs> totally perfect there's problems in that and i've learned a lot of that too in the, in the last several years but um and especially the way it sort of it, it, it inserts itself into or like it, institutions you should uh, use it i should say absolutely yeah. yeah there's there's a lot of issues so that's where i just thought some of this is just kind of it's like we're we're like you know hitting our head on the wall trying to do this in certain kind of places it's not going to happen it's not what it's about it's actually antithetical to the thing even if they want to say that they're doing it they're not doing it and if we you know i feel like there's this thing i've been starting to try to write with this for some other stuff i'm thinking about these um those picture things that are illusions where there's like you can see a duck or you can see a rabbit you know that kind of thing so or Ernest, I think his name is Ernest Gomerick or something. This um, early, um, very important art historian has in one of his books where he has these, one of these little pictures. And I was thinking about how we deal with this kind of illusion, delusion situation all the time and stuff that we just choose to ignore and mm -hmm. act like we don't see it. But if we just go, yes, this is what the problem is. This is it. And stop lying about it and pretending. And, um, you know, a lot of us, feel that there's no way to operate out with without you know there, it's hard because of funding and stuff right so you go well how do you do that work without these these hegemonic institutions it's impossible the thing is other things do exist they don't get funded nearly enough <laughs> they're not getting the money and the support that they should get but a lot of the otherwise already does exist in the world and could get some support and other things can be made and um if you want to do certain kind of work that actually cares about community, that cares about racial justice issues, that cares about social justice, you probably don't do it in these these spaces. <laughs> like you don't do it in the hegemonic um, white institution that's doing all this racist stuff. That you just it's right. not what it does. And some people want to believe that that's going to change um, because they had a diversity class. Love to see it. Haven't seen <laughs> it in life, but you know if it happens, good. That's nice. But I doubt it, you know, and other people have pointed out that, um, you know, we do ourselves a disservice when we keep believing the issue is one of people just, they don't know. And that's why we have to do the raising awareness. They don't know. And if we keep staying in here and keep teaching people, people the same thing over and over for decades, then one of the days they're going to, you know, um, treat us better and not kill us and all, all of this. And instead of redirecting our energies and putting them in the things in some pockets where we can actually maybe start to build some momentum. So yeah, so this is um, a see beholding as part of this, like finding a way to try to do that. Like I'm in that process. And this is thinking again with Christina Sharp's book in the wake, there's a passage it's on page 101 if you want to know um, where she talks about beholding and the ability to see ourselves and really kind of stay with ourselves instead of going back to that where we don't see each other now it's is it the duck or is it the rabbit like we're going to keep playing that game what if we accept that there are certain conditions that are out here and i just think there's so many really brilliant people like really smart people and gosh, if we could get more of them together to start building the otherwise and working on the otherwise that already exists versus to continue to um, play that delusion, illusion, delusion game with these places. And I get it, it's very hard, but I just think more of us can start to do that. So yeah, this project is me trying to turn more of my energy to that and working um, in Chris, Sheila's, Sheila Pretty Bright, her work came to mind to me because this mural when she before she had even made it she was talking to me about the project when i was visiting her once or i was just down in atlanta but i, I did see her down there 
And she was telling me about what she was doing, working with these mo mothers who um, have sadly experienced this violence, um, state violence very directly because they lost their children to it. And she's doing this retreat with them and then created this uh, you know, image that she was working on, this whole project and doing a portrait of them. And I thought it was really beautiful. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh my God. So I wanna kind of come back and work with her on that and bring it back. And we wanna do a public art intervention where that will occur again, but not just in Atlanta. And so um, this is an opportunity to kind of do some of that. And going to public art is somewhat different, but not for me, because a lot of my research is actually on stuff in public spaces. It's not about stuff in museum collections actually right. at all. So this brings me in some way to connect back to research that I've been doing for a long time in a more kind of like academic setting. Yeah, you know, I think that was really interesting. You're brought, brought up where people feel like if we keep doing the same thing over again, we're going to get different results. I think that was, and but I think even then, sometimes we have some naivete around like how these kind of issues get resolved and what change actually looks like. Um, so, you know, a few years ago, I interviewed scholar Lee Ray Rayford about photography and liberation. And she said something that really stuck with me that I think a lot about this was, you know, uh, years ago, we all said, oh, well, if all police officers had cameras, we would be able to figure out, you know, that what was going wrong. And I think not a lot of us realize how naive that assumption was. And I'm wondering what, as a curator, what are some of the naive assumptions you're forced to deal with again and again when it comes to material? Um, that that they're curating and particularly around because you you did a wonderful collection of, of questions uh, in your piece beholding and curating with care which by the way I want to mention someone in the chat um, Angela Mack from Fort Worth Texas said she, she was so happy for this and your list on care and curatorial practice is her guiding checklist for the archive that is central to her project so I just wanted to give you kudos for that but um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about what are some of those assumptions that maybe in retrospect you think oh I keep having to deal with this assumption or about this material um, are there any questions, are there any things like that? And I wanted to ask a little bit about what drove you to do these questions, because I think those were very useful for people to think through. Yeah, I think questions are good because, I mean, I feel like it's part of like, you know, when you're a student, you get all these questions thrown at you, right? And I don't have answers for all, like personally, if I was to answer all of those, I wouldn't be able to, and they're not easy. The point isn't that they would be easy and that there's even a right answer is, is like what I would want to stress is that, but I do think we should go through that because some stuff, especially like photography, there's this assumption that it's um, just truthful as objective and it's evidence and it's, you know, not shaped by human actors or whatever. And that's, scary and actually a lot of us do that and we we keep doing it right with our assumption um or if we show this work or if we repeat it and especially thinking about people taking like literal images of people being murdered and we keep sharing them like on social media and stuff right away and i partly understand sometimes the 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 first impetus or something to do that because a feeling of lament like oh my god i can't believe these people are doing this to us again i understand that in a way but also it's kind of like, what is, what is that going to do? Like, it's, it's, I feel like more of us should be trying to ask those questions and slow ourselves down. One of the problems I think um, in museums sometimes is that the, the pace is real crazy, um, trying to keep up with doing so much stuff. And there's a lot of factors of why that happens, but the pace gets to be so that you don't have actually much of an opportunity to really one, even learn about the thing you're supposed to be um, you know, showing so that you can research it, that you understand it, and then, you know, share and learn as a group with the team of people that you work with, that everybody understands this material. That is very hard to do. So then there's no time to ask any questions of anything. And unfortunately, at some places, a curator is really working by herself and deciding this is what the show is going to be. I've decided it. I'm going to work on a lot of stuff by myself for a long time. And then I'm going to give it to other people to just do their thing and they get it at the last minute and then they're trying to run and, and scramble to do that so we're not really in in museums there's a tendency in a lot of places to use this term that we work as we collaborate and i'm like i hardly have ever been in spaces where people are actually collaborating um <laughs> not. there's a groups of people but they are 
somebody is driving like everything that's happening, you know, one person or a group of people, they're making the decisions and then other people are assigned roles. That isn't collaboration. At best, that's what Tom Finkelpearl, he talks about in his book, What We May, um, it's a study of like public art. And he talks about that, like he sees it as cooperation when people at best agree to work together in this certain kind of way versus collaboration when you actually design something together, you work on it together, you do the um, evaluation of it together, like the whole process. That's a very different kind of um, thing. So yeah, asking questions I think is very important and more of us need to do that. And especially if we're gonna be working with material that is, um, you know, subject matter that's really difficult like violent kind of subjects. Um, like I studied this lynching stuff and I've been doing it for a long time. I have to say, it's a bit like once you go in there and you start doing it, it's like, uh, it's a bit of, it's horrible. It's like you get, I, and I try not to even do it right before I go to sleep because I keep thinking about this stuff. Um, I personally have never done an exhibition of lynching photography. Um, I've studied it for a long time. Some of the stuff I've read, I've never even repeated it out loud to somebody else because it's some really horrific stuff. I've read it, you know, in the book, but I don't, I, people I know don't even study this, a lot of people I know. And for me to talk about it them with them out of context is just like, what, whoa. So I don't bring it to them. Um, but if I was gonna do this, it would have to be for a reason. And I should be able to kind of say why. I, what I've seen, unfortunately, is sometimes people think the artwork should do all of that work. It, it answer everything that anybody may have. And the people that work at the institution don't have to answer anything. It's just, it's there. It's, and they don't know. That's the real thing is they don't know. And they haven't asked any questions. That's the scary part. Cause I'm like, well, why did you want to do this? Or what do you think this is doing? And they're like, I don't know. It's just, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's the thing. And I feel like um, we do a disservice when we do that, that we should try to get involved and we might not have answers to all of that. And it is hard but it's the work is to do that. And especially at these times when people keep saying that they're doing all this reckoning and so forth. And I'm like, really? Where? Yeah, I, I'm a good point. You know, I think that one of the questions in your list, you said, who is most harmed by the violence? Which brought up for me, um, is sometimes curating a form of harm reduction? I mean, you know, cause I, I kind of wonder because this, these images and this violence happens outside the door, it happens on our screens, it walks with us into a museum, it walks with us anywhere because now they're so accessible. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that, how you see that relationship, if, if, if that is something you think about um, in terms of the violence of, of the work in an institution like a museum. Um, yeah, I think sometimes it could be like, you know, as I just um, bash this whole thing about bringing awareness to things. I'm not saying that's the, like totally bad, but when that's your only thing that you're trying to do, that's that's kind of an issue. It's not actually. Well, I, th I mean, I understood it as sort of like when that becomes the end result and conclusion, then yeah. you're sort of only starting. Right. right. And then you're just moving on to the next thing. Um, yeah, I think, you know, at best, you can try to create some spaces. I like when people think of the museum as a forum. That's an idea that I like learned in my museum studies classes. And I really like that idea, like a space where people really are in conversation and discourse about, um, you know, experiences, the art and the histories. And it's a place for people to kind of come together and share that stuff. And that's to me at its best when it has those opportunities. And some people, some exhibits, some exhibitions people created, they really, I like ones that seem to have these moments of quiet spaces that they've developed in them. And they thought about, you know, this is when they've been really thoughtful and they think about like how people will experience this and a range of different kind of folks too, you know, because different people are going to have, you know, different responses to this and are, some are have, uh, especially if it's stuff on violent subject matter, have a closer proximity and likelihood of experiencing that violence and may have and have loved ones that have. So places that you know, when someone's being more thoughtful about it, they are making a show have these kind of moments. One of the good things I learned early on was, and this was really about hanging work, but I think you can apply it in general about curating. Um, when I was um, working at Yale, I learned this from the director who was saying, you know, when you think about hanging work, you should think about moments of rest, like in music. So 
there's notes, you know, how the music, I was thinking about jazz music. I think we were having a conversation about jazz, but then there's these moments where there's a, a short rest or a long rest and do that when you arrange work on the wall. But I think also when you arrange work in a, throughout an entire space, you can do that as well. You can make these moments where something is, um, you know, more acute and then a, a rest kind of space. And you can do that in, in ways that, you know, don't say this is a rest space on literally on the wall, but you can do that, you know, by the furniture kind of arrangements, you can do stuff with paint and lighting and, you know, stuff like that. Um, those are kind of, I think, thoughtful ways to change stuff up. What else did you, I can't even remember what you exactly asked. At this no, point. it's all good. It's all good. Okay. So I just want to remind people to sort of put their questions in because we're, you know, about 10, 15 minutes, uh, we have to wrap things up soon. But I also wanted to ask, I mean, there are a lot of different kinds of questions here. I'm just going to sort of scan them. Um, someone asked, maybe curating could be both not producing further harm as well as harm reduction. That's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, so, uh, but then I also wanted to ask in terms of your own work, um, what, you know, how do small institutions that are sort of, you know, have, have very few resources, how do they respond to these questions without just overburdening staff? Do you know, because I think there's this also this idea of that, that they keep sort of uh, pushing things onto staff that have like these growing lists of duties and things to do, and they have to re-educate themselves and they have to do this and that. Now, have you ever seen uh, successful models, I think, within that, but also in terms of the curator, curators are also being asked sometimes to do more and more and more. How do you how do you negotiate that? How do you cope with that? Yeah, that's that's, that's definitely an issue in museums and especially and well even at bigger places that have more staff, it's still an issue because a lot of times what they do is just create more and more projects that they can't even handle. That was one of the interesting things of working at places with that had a lot more resources and more staff, but they still had way too much work that they had kind of taken right. on to and then it's small places so it's it can be kind of the same problem um what i propose like with these questions isn't to hopefully inundate people but to try to slow down things and not that they would necessarily engage all of that but to try to rethink and i think sometimes in terms of like staffing people can do stuff like you know i'm gonna like i'm doing pre-pandemic um when people did meet and you know sit and have lunch together or something like that some of the stuff can be questions you raise and talk with one another and talk about um our practice of being in conversation you could do that in professional spaces too you can also do some of this stuff with community that's what's actually to me real interesting you, there's one of working with people in your institution you can work with other institutions and be in conversation whenever you can um but especially if you can do it with the communities right where you are, that's really great. I think is sharing some of those questions with, if you already have established relationships with other you know, um, cultural centers in town, bring a question to them and, and be in dialogue, go back and forth. That, that, that's like a, that could be a, you know, a program, but not to be a program for something just to be on display, but for people to really be doing that work of like really you know understanding these issues and then being able to kind of see if they can retool some some way that they think i think operate yeah. so i'd like to also ask a little bit about your relationship with the artist uh sheila brie bright because i feel like you know it's always a nice match when you see like an artist and a curator sort of like be simpatico and sort of like really sort of I'm, I'm i'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you make that decision to work with an artist and what is it about their work or maybe their worldview that kind of helps you make that decision? Yeah, Sheila, I've known for a long time. Um, and I don't even remember when I first saw her work, but I saw it, might have saw it on Hyper. It was some of her early work was on um, the, sub, the suburb, suburbia. She had this whole series. And um, then later she started getting really well known for this stuff she's been doing for like, she did for about seven years, really being on the ground and looking at these demonstrations. Um, but it, you know the early work I knew, and then I had an opportunity. Um, somebody asked me to be a moderator for a panel or something. I had an opportunity to meet her in person, and then I just kept I just kept following her work online. And um, you know she has got guts. I like that about her. She's got guts, and um, you know she kind of she was really committed to this being on the ground and going to these cities and and taking pictures of what's happening with these these movements and especially these young generation that's been saying you know no we're not gonna we're not gonna accept this 
she's very committed to that and it really impressed me and um I just thought I'd like to kind of stick around and keep following her work I love the work what it looks like and I really like her energy and her commitment to social issues and not everybody has that because some people don't even want to get involved in certain topics because they're like oh all that political stuff you know it's not popular you're gonna get in trouble you know it's, it's a bunch of, like people are scared of some of these topics and I I admire that Sheila sticks with it because she believes in it and I've decided I mean I always want to work with people that I really believe in their work but I think for me especially now in this this my new iteration of self I'm trying to think about working with with not not trying to go after stuff like oh that's really beautiful I want to I want to work with as many people as possible but more slowing down and working with people that I've known for actually a long time like five years or more or something and um that's a very different kind of way to work but, but for me that's part of this beholding thing too I think that I'm just figuring out what that means but it's it's different and that's part of like well that's not being objective that's not that's not a neutral process for curating and it's like yeah it's not and Got so on. <laughs> totally. Okay, so we have a few questions here I wanted to get to. One of them, and I swear I never asked this, so I, I didn't write this, but it says, can you talk about something that inspired you or unexpectedly learned about this experience with hyperallergic that you can take away for future work? So I guess sort of like this kind of fellowship and what it sort of allowed you to uh, think through. Hmm, that's, wow, you probably had an inside person on that one. I did not, and she even has her name out here, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wanda, for asking that. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, this has been a good experience. It's a bit different. And, you know, like, I've really written mostly academic kind of papers and then museum um, kind of text. And I have written, like, on blogs and stuff like that, right? And I've done that kind of thing. But um, th this is a bit different. And it's been, I guess, mostly the pace. There's, like, a little compressed time. I mean, I knew what I was going to write about, but still hadn't written it. You know, right. <laughs> so then it comes down to <laughs> press piece, and and I knew this about these these press people. I'm gonna just say this about these media people. Man, they like they like to get their response like quick. And I'll sometimes, I mean, people who know me know I'll be taking real long. Actually, just wrote somebody tonight that wrote me back in April last year. That's horrible. <laughs> but, yeah, that's that's the hardest part. Is the pace is really kind of things are compressed. And it's not like when you're writing academic thing and you're just taking for like a really long time. I want to read another book to make sure this is not that. And right. uh, footnotes, I like to have a lot of footnotes and they condense everything down and they just like do links to a book. And I'm like, okay, that's different. <laughs> different. You know, it's, a different totally. it's a different form. Totally. And then this question is interesting. I wonder if you're interested in chiming in. Um, uh, somebody asks, how did you feel about the controversy at the National Gallery of Arts decision uh, process about the Philip Gustin exhibit and in relation to the work with the KKK Im imagery? How might that have been handled with care and sensitivity? I'm curious if you have any general thoughts about that, because I don't think it's unique to the National Gallery of Art, but you know, work that does exhibit images that are related to uh, many of the topics that you cover, but also about racial violence. Um, any thoughts on that in general? Yeah, um, I followed that a little bit when it happened, but not actually so much. So it's not really fresh in my mind, but I'm thinking about some other exhibits that I've been to as well. So like this was a few years ago at, at the Blanton Museum in um, Austin, Texas. I was I was a speaker at a conference they did about, it was real interesting about racism in museums. I was like, you guys are actually going to admit that happens that the museums have racism um it, they do but museums never like usually acknowledge that so i was impressed by that but they had some work on view and of course what's his name vincent uh, i can't remember his last name i hate that when i can't remember some of the artist's name um i can't remember his name right now i'm sorry but um really great artist and he does these these paintings of some of them have like kkk figures in them they really, I think, did a lot of work. I mean, you know, from what I saw, it looked like they did a lot of training with their staff about why they were doing this and had people in the space who could talk about it. Um, I think they had some literature on the wall about it. It seemed like they had done like layers. There was there was some planning, you know, they obviously had planned things out. And um, it was important to show. And yeah, the work is about a definitely violent um, subject material. Um, but this artist, this is a longstanding kind of practice of why he's been, you know, how he's been making this work for a long time. He has 
a discussion about why he's been doing it. He, I think he'd been doing it for years. Um, I just wish I could remember his last name. I'll think of it right after this, of course, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, there are ways to do stuff. So that's why people should follow you on Instagram and Twitter because you'll bring it up there. So how, yeah. how's that for a plug? I'll, I'll bring it up and I'll find it because I'm like, I know it's probably right next to me. Um, there are ways to do this, especially if you have time. You know, if you try to compress stuff and you don't have time, it's definitely going to be bad. And, you know, um, sometimes they, people get this criticism. I was watching Kirsten P. Buick. She has this talk that she did in 2020. And I was watching a YouTube of it last night. And she was looking at the Clarence Thomas um, testimony and when he, in the Anita Hill testimony and when Clarence Thomas used the term lynching and how that just kind of froze things. And he had kind of said a word and you know said that he 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 found himself being that he was under a high-tech lynching or something right and it was really that Anita Hill was the one who had experienced all of this very aggressive kind of um, sexual harassment probably from him um, but he made himself kind of the victim and once he had pulled that word it was like the the senate didn't know how to respond and it just kind of shut down and so um, I'm just bringing it up because I think sometimes certain things because they're flashpoint things in our society that we've been lying about forever or some people have been lying about forever and if you don't actually ever really say what the, the issue is and address it then you can just fall apart and things just stop and often then they just move on to another thing instead of actually stopping to address this real underlying giant gap this, you know, that everybody knows is there, but we don't deal with it. I hope that kind of answered that question. It did. And uh, my, Matthew Clay Robinson was kind enough to add, it's Vincent Valdez. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I was thinking it was a V last name too. Thank you for that, Vincent Valdez. And there's an article that was posted here, Matthew uh, posted from The Guardian, if people are interested in knowing about that work. So I think we're wrapping up a little bit, but we're, um, I just want to ask a couple of um, quick questions, if that's all right with you. I, I hope they're quick, I should say. Um, I guess someone's asking about how, um, you know, uh, in the post-George Floyd world is, is how they described it, how that may have um, affected your ability to bridge and connect with audiences or have audiences changed. Has that informed a bigger part of the community so that your work is easier, or harder? I'm curious how, how you see that, if at all, if there's been a change. I mean, not, I don't think so for me. I mean, it might be some, some people that, um, you know, reach out after the, you know, some of these uprisings happen across the country, more people kind of reach out and want to, to, to say they want to know more about my work or something like that. Um, but the, for, in terms of the communities I'm really trying to reach, I don't think that's changed, um, except for that some of us are just more committed to doing our work, but, um, and I, I say it like that because some people, I think it's, they, you know, the, these things happen and then they want to do something and they, but they want it to be a quick response. They want to, you know, um, and not, not necessarily, but it might be like, check the box. We, we contacted a black curator who talks about all this stuff all the time and now we're done and we're good. Um, but when you're making kind of a commitment that this is going to be like my life work or something, then it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of energy. And I think there's a lot of people who are doing this community kind of work all the time. And um, I like to work with youth groups and stuff. Those people have been doing this work. So I don't find that that different. Okay. I mean, I could talk to you forever, but I'm going to ask you two more questions and then we'll wrap up <laughs> just because I think it's really important. This question is from a woman of color who works in a UK museum as a curator. And she's asking, do you think curating art is more viable, enjoyable for people of color than trying to work in a museum? And I'm, I'm not quite sure what that is. And I guess the question is, what is the difference? So I guess the question is whether your role as a curator has been different than just working in a museum in another capacity and whether that has been different for you um, as a woman of color. Um, not totally sure if I understand. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure either, but I think we kind of understand maybe a little yeah. bit like the, sort of like in the different roles, whether they're there. Um, uh, so mainly my, in museums, I've mainly worked in curatorial. I have done some, a little bit of education, but really not that much in terms of like, you know, those fixed roles or what they call it, the title of the department or something. Even though I see a lot of my work as being as an educator and whatever. Um, I think it might be definitely different, at some, especially at some places. Um, 
because of certain kind of cultures that are set up about what education is and whatever and how those people can operate versus what cura curation is and how curators operate. There are definitely certain cultures that are set up, especially at like very traditional um, conventional kind of institutions. And that might not be the case so much at a different kind of place, but it might, for some people might find that education is more freeing to them for the type of work they want to do. I know people, I think Kirsten P. Buick said that in that YouTube video I was watching. She said something like she got, she was a museum educator for like several, four years or something. She did, got sick of talking to curators. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that was the people that was exciting for her to talk to. And she moved into um, being an academic and she loves talking with, with students. So sometimes, yeah, there are definitely some areas that are more freeing, I think. I think that's maybe what that's, that question is getting at. Probably, I think so. Um, so I guess someone's also asking Bobby Regans. Um, I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Are there galleries or museums you've noticed that are progressive in inclusiveness, social justice, community care, and are doing the work in that space? I guess someone's asking for your sort of perspective on institutions and places that have um, been doing some of the work. And I mean, I don't want to give anyone a full pass because I think everyone has le different levels of doing the work, right? Um, but I guess someone is asking about that. Um, and then they also asked, again, I didn't ask this question. They're asking how this fellowship is different than other fellowships you've had. So I'm not sure why everyone's so interested in this right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, at least the first part of the question would be great to get your perspective. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I actually should spend more time thinking about that. I've seen a lot and I kind of, I find it hard to answer because for me, for real, unless I've really worked there and spent time, I don't really like to, because I, I used to do this more and I'm trying to get better about assumptions about places, because a lot of, uh, you know, I did this a lot for a long time, making assumptions because people have a particular exhibition or something, right? And you think, oh, they, and they do a lot of a certain kind of exhibition, that, that means therefore that's a good place um, to be and that they, they believe in these principles and it's a good place to work and all that doesn't necessarily mean that. So I've been learning that over and over again. And now I'm just kind of like, yeah, I'm going to shut my mouth. So unless I've really worked there or like have a very, a friend that works there and I, that I really know well and can trust their opinion, I try to be careful about that. But, you know, at some point I might try to come up with a list of some things and maybe just share it on social, some places that I, that I think might be like that. But I'm going to say that for now, because that's one I have that's to be careful with. No, I mean, I understand how you're saying that there are some institutions I used to say, oh, they're doing it so right. And then you learn more and you're like, well, they're just like any institution. Do you know, they're like, they do some things right and they do some things not so right. Um, I think uh, somebody's asking about resources for curating and, and uh, informing their own experience and for curating for a predominantly white community. I would suggest following Latanya and her work and uplifting her work as well as other black curators, as well as people who are actually doing the work. Um, but I'm wondering if there are any other resources you'd want to share for people who may be new to this question and have only started thinking about this. Yeah, and there are definitely some people starting to form, you know, different initiatives and things um, in the arts. I think AAMD has something they're doing, with, um, some kind of important networking opportunities for curators of color. So you might want to look into that. Um, in public history, there are some people that actually reached out for me to work with them, but I just kind of don't have time because I really need to be writing my dissertation. Um, but there, that's what the Smithsonian that they're doing. And I don't know if it's specifically for curators of color, but it's working with people working with, I think, African American histories. Um, there's some definite initiatives, and I can also see if I can think of some more of those that I can put on my social if you follow me at Our Stuff Matters on Twitter right. or G. Art stuff matters on, on uh, yep, so people can learn. Well, thank you, Latanya. It's, it was a pleasure. I was looking forward to this conversation for years. I knew we would have it eventually, and here we are. So, and thank you for sharing. I think the questions have been really important for a lot of people. People haven't really thought of that. And I love uh, how you've been uplifting um, Sheila Bright's work um, in general, because I think it's been really great to see the care you're giving to this project, so. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined and all the great questions. I was trying to read them at the same time. It was really hard to, to do that. But um, thank you. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate the opportunity.
And I just want to thank the Emily H. Tremaine Foundation for supporting this project and, and uh, allowing curators to spend some time doing the research and, and supporting the work they're doing. Because as we know, curators are never given the resources necessary to achieve everything that's possible, or at least they're not often, I should say. How's that? Um, so I just think that's really wonderful. And thank you, Latanya. And I hope everyone continues to follow your work and for uh, doing the work and 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 you know helping all of us by doing that. Thank Thanks you again. So much. I also want to say thanks, Sheila, of course, for her absolutely wonderful and the kindness of sharing that and also sort of engaging with the public and working with the curator. You know, um, it's 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 really it's difficult for artists, I know, because it can feel very vulnerable working with someone who's sort of helping define the way people see your work. It's a lot, but thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. Great, thanks everyone. <laughs>